Hi, um, my name is Jana Steele. I'm a reader and a writer. I read Christina Robertson's story, The Awful Thing, when it first came out in issue 36 of the Bellevue Literary Review. And I've read it a couple times since um, because of the resonance of the themes. Um, this story, I feel, speaks to what it means to be human and what it means to start losing who we are. Um, in the story, um, just to give y'all some context, um, the narrator's mother is named Liz Carthage. She's an ex-dancer. She's a beautiful woman who now happens to have advanced Alzheimer's disease. And she lives in a care facility. And the narrator remembers who her mother was, even as she's faced with the reality of what her mom, and by extension, she is losing daily because of the disease. Um, when Liz falls in love with a fellow resident who's named Harmon Triplett, um, there are some seismic repercussions. Harmon also has cognitive issues. He, um, he also happens to be married. And Harmon's wife, who still lives in you know, the outside world, um, she's less than thrilled with this budding love affair that has crept up or cropped up between Harmon and um, uh, Liz. Um, one of the beautiful things about this story though, is that it explores um, what this connection or relationship um, uh, says about being human and what it means um, to live. And the narrator is sharing this journey with a really powerful mix of humor and pathos and in fact, Christina, that is one of the things that so struck me about this story is um, I love that mix of tragedy and humor. And it's an old chestnut, but that idea of, you know, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Um, and you navigate that balance really well. Um, I also was struck by Christina has a really confident, thoughtful grasp of descriptions. Um, you see this place, my friend, this care facility where love is growing. And so as a reader, I, I, I saw it too. And I saw all the kindness and the tragedy and the pathos and the beauty that played out in these hallways and that ultimately contribute to the journey that Liz and her daughter are on. Um, uh, so all that said, I hope you'll read us an excerpt from The Awful Thing. This afternoon's New Year's Eve party is in the day room. Occasions here are typically observed with shiny cardboard decorations, theme cookies, and blue cow ice cream cups. However, today the day room is particularly festive. They are serving non-alcoholic champagne, fruit punch out of a crystalline bowl, and pizza. Awkwardly draped Happy New Year crepe paper banners silver plasticware, streamers, and white balloons force a kind of undeniable, if manufactured, cheer upon us. Many have donned glittery party hats and hold onto noisemakers. The gala began at four, making us fashionably late. Adherence to a schedule is kind of ironic since the staff and visitors are the only ones with any concept of time. The staff are good-humored, loose, and giddy. The music and amicable compromise of golden oldies, the likes of Glenn Miller and the Andrews sisters, and the best of earth, wind, and fire. Karen and Beatrice from housekeeping are dancing with each other and any of the spit-shined residents they can coax up out of a chair. Visiting family members coax as well or sit dutifully beside their vacant mother, father, sister, brother, or spouse, trying to share the mock excitement, or perhaps just trying not to cry. I can't bear to look at the sallow faces of those residents who are totally lost, our petrified wood with beating hearts. Instead, I paste on a smile and step aside, allowing my mother to make her entrance with the dramatic flair of her youth. 
It's been two weeks since the pants incident and a full week since any improprieties have been filed by the staff. As far as I know, equilibrium, as defined by no one dropping their pants, has been restored on 4 West. All we have to contend with is everything else. My mother glances at me, then toddles into the sea of dithering revelers, a twig wearing red lipstick. In his aged graying body with its slight jowls and sags, Harmon's eyes shine like polished onyx when he sees my mother. He is sitting in the circle of chairs with his wife who holds onto his hand. Laurel is standing nearby, talking with the nurse's assistant, Joyce, and nibbling at a square of waxen looking pizza. Quivering and quaking, he suddenly makes an effort to rise. They are playing Moonlight Serenade. It's Christina, thank you. Oh my gosh, I love this story so much. Um, so if I may, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Um, one of the things I really admire about the awful thing is your attention to detail. And just looking back at the excerpt you just read, um, there are some stunning descriptions. And um, for example, the party goers, they're not just eating any ice cream, they're eating um, blue cow ice cream cups, which I just wanna say that is such a spot on detail. Um, you also devastatingly described Liz as a twig wearing red lipstick. And tell me, how do you find your way to these descriptions um, that dig so deep? Um, did they appear early on in the story um, or did they come later as you flush things out? Well, um, I suppose I opened the gates of my brain pretty wide from the get-go. <laughs> um, I'm searching for what rises from the emotional weight of the subject rather than making a, a physical sketch with words. I want to emphasize the difference in how the ordinary is perceived under extraordinary circumstances to you know, strip things of like ordinary appeal. You know, ice cream is something we always associate with happiness. Under these circumstances, it had to be emotionally sterilized. You know, it had to become institutional. And for me, that's blue cow ice cream cups. <laughs> well done. <laughs> so this, uh, and, you know, the lovely Liz in her bottle green hourglass cocktail dress, which was mentioned earlier in the story, you know, that woman's disintegrated. You know, she's she's lost so much dimension, literally figured, you know, physically and, and mentally. Um, despite a swipe of lipstick, she's she's no longer a full force. You know, she's lost her leaves, so to speak. Um, so I saw her that, you know, that way, like as a, a fragile remnant. Yeah. Uh, and I did a lot of it came to me in the initial drafts, um, probably inspired by my raw observations, um, having experienced Alzheimer's disease firsthand over the course of many gut-wrenching years. <clears throat> uh, you know. It's a long journey, I, isn't it? Yes. And so a lot of the language I feel like may come as much from my heart as my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't know, do you have any yep. questions for me as, <laughs> as a reader? Well, I, of course, I want to know about your, you know, what might be your favorite moment or moments in the story and why as a reader, you may have found connection there or were surprised. I mean, was it something you identified with or, or something you hadn't anticipated maybe? Okay, so I've got uh, my, my, the first thing I've got to tell you that comes to mind, and I promise, no spoilers, um, is the ending of this story. And um, uh, as a reader and a writer, I know how hard it is to nail the ending. And this is not a long story. I mean, this is not a novella. It's very tight, but in that space, you sometime, somehow manage to make this ending an earned moment. Um, 
as I said, I'm not going to give any spoilers, but I feel like you really, with this ending, you get to the heart of what it means to be human, um, even when disease has the power to rob us of so much. Um, all I can say, my friend, is um, bravo. It's, again, it's a relatively short story, and I was really floored by how deep you were able to dig in this topic. Well, I, I was kind of really interested in looking at the, the morality uh, in, in a way of this, this whole situation, you know, what, what, what is really right and what's wrong, you know, what makes it right and what makes it wrong. Yeah. And I think that depends a lot on, on context. Oh, oh my gosh, get out of my head. I was just <laughs> thinking that. <laughs> I mean, I think that's something that I, I find in a lot of my stories that I, that I, Right. Um, that I, I find that I'm always sort of exploring that, you know, um, what society may see as wrong under the circumstances is is maybe the only way to go, the best way to go um, to be in the moment with somebody who thinks they're in love with somebody that they don't even know. And, uh, you know, I mean, maybe that's a good thing. That's not the awful thing in in this situation uh, so in in fact um just that nuance that you describe you know it's very easy to look at the world in a black or white way but there's so many nuanced situations mm -hmm. and this story is one example about that uh, one example of that in fact um i um uh kind of building on that um i think i mentioned earlier one of the things I really admire about the awful thing is the way you navigate that balance of um, pathos and humor and talk about nuance. Um, something isn't necessarily just funny, like Adam Sandler funny. Um, <laughs> make that what you will. Um, or it's, um, it's also not all tragic. And um, I wonder if um, you can speak to the tools you drew on to access access that nuanced conversation between humor and pathos. Well, I, I mean, I'm I'm glad you asked about that because I I do feel that's a, a huge uh, part of of it, it became a huge part of the experience for me personally when my mother, who was not a ballerina but a writer, uh, was going through this. Um, we were going down this long, long road together. Um, I, when she was finally moved into a nursing facility, I, I was anguished and felt very guilty. Um, um, although she didn't have any sense of the fact that she was moving into a nursing home, she thought it was a hotel, a nice hotel. Um, I felt terribly guilty. Um, and I, I think that I had to, I think at the time, uh, my prior career was um, in, in psychiatric service. So I feel like I sort of went back to, you know, what helped me navigate difficult emotions uh, while working with psychiatric patients. And, and that had been the ability to make a little light, to find lightness in the darkest places. Um, and I found that angle helpful in surviving the grief of slowly losing my mother. Um, bleak humor is a powerful tool uh, when faced with such gravity. Um, it's kind of like whistling a tune when you're afraid. Oh, um, wow. Powerful analogy. <laughs> uh, well, I guess I've had plenty, plenty of time to think about it. Um, I mean, that to me, that's how finding this sort of incoherent love between strangers on a locked ward uh, sort of mitigates the, the truly awful thing. It, it helps helps us to cope with finding ourselves on this sort of different planet with its different consciousness. Um, so I guess because I guess I feel like I applied that to my my past experiences to my past professional experiences um, 
to try to help sort of keep myself together personally during this personal experience. Yes. Oh, I um, thank you for that. That's um, thank you for sharing. I am really struck by how um, just thinking about the context you just gave and how in the story, Liz and Harmon, you know, they're experiencing their moments of joy. Um, but that's something that if um, people related to them who are a little bit more cognizant of society's rules, mm -hmm. um, they can tap into that. That's a comfort too. Um, and that's a, um, it's a stretch for the narrator, yeah. um, which is I, I just, I want to let people know that it's okay. Yeah. That all, all of that is okay. I mean, the, the, you, you know, you don't have any real ability to impact the, the, the disease, the progression of the disease, but you can, you can help yourself and you can help your loved one by trying to be in the moment with them, <clears throat> not correcting, but just allowing. And um, I guess that's part of what I was trying to illustrate. You know, it, and you illustrated it gorgeously. And I'm, it brings to mind, and forgive the pronunciation, but Rilke wrote, you know, that expression, um, Denik Preysen, which I believe means um, roughly translated is joy in spite of. And I feel like the awful thing really mines that vein. I have one more, I have a question for you oh, also. Just, <laughs> um, did you, because in thinking about, you know, the story for me, of course, brings up so many real memories, not those particular memories, but uh, memories of my mother's experience uh, and mine on that unit. Uh, did you feel the narrator's experience expanded your own understanding of the disease? I mean, I, what I refer to as its thievery, um, you know, its ripple effects on others. Oh, Christina, 100%. Um, thievery, I think, is a really um, apt word. Um, uh, in this story, what's really evident is that kind of um, insidiousness of dementia, you know, that sneaky attrition that manifests in um, large ways, but also small ways. And um, I feel like I came away from this story thinking this, um, that Alzheimer's is a disease that even though a person is still living, we're missing them ahead of time. It's like anticipatory grief, I guess. Yes. Um, <laughs> and um, we're missing who they used to be. And um, a great example, you alluded to this earlier. Um, the narrator remembers this you know, spectacular dress her mom wore. Her mom was always so chic, that bottle green dress. And it had this gorgeous silhouette. And she was beautiful. And when, fast forward, the narrator's helping her mom get ready for this party that you described in the excerpt. And there's brown polyester pants. And this is a detail, oh my gosh, I wonder if you witnessed this on your journey with your mom, a necklace that who knows if it's even hers. And um, that contrast, um, man, there is, um, uh, it's that idea of, despite the narrator's best efforts, her mom's not the same person. And even though the daughter loves her so deeply and the care roles have been reversed, that's not something the narrator can recreate for her mom. And um, there's this one passage that I just, I just wanna mention that captures that. Um, this is what the narrator says. I see that Liz Carthage is just another entry in the turtle races. The only difference being that I painted her shell. Oh my gosh, my friend, that line just broke my heart. Um, so thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thanks for this conversation, Janice. I, we've talked before and I love talking with you, but it, I, it's nice to have the opportunity to 
hear your thoughts and about this story and kind of talk to you about something that's important to me. Um, oh my gosh, I am. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, chat and interface. Um, it means a lot to me to let you know how much this story meant to me. And um, oh, by the way, and thanks to Bellevue Literary Review, um, I feel like, um, tell me your thoughts, but I feel like the magazine is such a powerful engine for um, making, uh, just bringing out uh, the vulnerability that illness, either emotional or physical, um, can bring to a patient, to people in the patient's life. Um, uh, I just, um, uh, I, I think it's an amazing forum. Yeah, I, I'd like to thank Bellevue for publishing the awful thing, first of all, of course, um, but for this opportunity to discuss the impact of Alzheimer's disease and how um, compassion might be the most effective medicine. Um, and I, I think Bellevue Literary Review supports a, a vital link in the chain of healthcare services, you know, expression through fiction or nonfiction poetry of the human experience at its most fragile and amazing. Um, so I wanna say thank you. It's in fact, oh my gosh, Christina, what you just said makes me think about, I was talking to another writer and she was talking about how in her writing, she draws on her own personal experiences, but um, just, she's also a voracious reader of both fiction and nonfiction to try and broaden her horizons. And I wanna say, I think that applies not just to writers, but to readers because when we read about experiences, either they resonate with us because we've experienced them ourselves, or it opens our eyes to other ways of being. And I think it can help us be more compassionate humans, whether we're writers ourselves or um, uh, just trying to better understand and experience the world. Mm -hmm.